This morning we have with us our guest preacher, who's Mr. Clyde Hawkins. He is the Associate Director of Missions for the Union Baptist Association. He is also he also heads up the satellite location of for Fruitland Bible Institute that is located at the UBA. And you talk to him about that and his light his eyes just light up. So he has he has a great passion for the Lord and a great passion uh, for what's going on at that satellite location for Fruitland. He's no stranger to our congregation. He has been here in the past to give God's word. And we, uh, if you would join me in giving him a warm welcome, Mr. Clyde Hawkins. It is my joy and privilege to be here again. I appreciate this church and appreciate all that you're doing for the Lord. I'm so grateful for your pastor. I consider him one of the best pastors that I know anywhere. And uh, all right, yeah, that's good. He's not only a good pastor, he is a great preacher. Okay. That's a rare combination these days, to find both of those in one. Again, I'm glad for the privilege of being here, and thank you for all that you're doing, and I have the privilege of bringing you greetings from the 80, 83 other Union Baptist Association churches. I stumble because the number changes every so often, and I keep, can't keep up with it, but 82 or 4 or somewhere along there anyway, a bunch of us, okay? Would you turn with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12? 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. In the first part of this chapter, Paul tells us about one of those special experiences of joy that he's been a part of. Fourteen years before he wrote this second letter to the church at Corinth, Paul was given a trip, a vacation trip to the third heaven. And he saw and heard things he couldn't even begin to write about. But I want us to focus our attention on verses 7 through 10 in this chapter. Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet or to torment me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, this thorn, I besought the Lord thrice or three times that it might depart from me. And the Lord said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ rests upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. This is part of Paul's autobiography. He tells us about that special promise that God made to him. God personally said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now, I look back on it, and this is one of the very first passages of Scripture I tried to preach for him many years ago. I don't remember what I said. I'm sure I said something like, God's grace is sufficient to save you, to sustain you, to supply all of your needs. I didn't have much experience to talk out of. But after 48 years plus of trying to preach the gospel, and after all kinds of experiences, including some deep valleys and mountaintops and trials and sickness and sadness and sorrow, I just want to stand here and boldly say to you this morning, loudly and clearly, 
that my God's grace is sufficient. Now, there have been a lot of titles given to this passage of Scripture. I think the most interesting one I've ever seen was the title, The Ministry of the Thorn. Paul says, There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, messenger of Satan, to buffet or, or to torment me. There are three main thoughts here I want us to see. There is suffering and supplication and sufficiency, or put it another way, pain, prayer, and provisions. Let's look at that first one. Notice the suffering that Paul experienced. Paul's thorn was painful. Every Christian, including Paul, including you and me, experiences troubles, trials, tears, tribulations, suffering is the common experience of all the members of the human family. Now, there's a gospel being preached today that is not biblical. The gospel of perfect health and instant wealth is not biblical. It is man-made. It's selfish. It's fleshly. It's dishonest, misleading. Now, I don't care if Benny does get on TV and say that it is, you know, just don't pay any attention to it. It's not in this book. Paul suffered from what he called a, a thorn in the flesh. Now, he's not talking about a little thorn off of a rose bush. The word here is a word that really was translated from the word for the stake that people were tortured on tied to and tortured on before they were executed by crucifixion. Paul's stake was very, very painful. This was a severe personal trial for the beloved Apostle Paul. Speculations of all kinds have been made about Paul's thorn. Some have tried to say that Paul suffered from partial, if not total, blindness. That's not said in the Bible. Others say Paul had epilepsy. Others say, oh, no, you was wrong. It was malaria. We don't know what Paul's thorn was. And since we don't know, we can more easily apply verse 9 to our own personal lives. There are two things that we know about Paul's thorn. One, it was physical. It was in the flesh. Two, it was painful. It was like a thorn. And we also know something else about quote, thorns in the flesh. We know our sufferings are real and painful. Our big question is still why? Why does a loving God permit his children to suffer? Why is it that seemingly the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve this kind of suffering. Now, I used to think that Christians should never ask why. I was sure that asking why would be a sign of my little faith. And I wanted to be counted among those who were full of faith. Then during one of the most trying times, most difficult times in my life, the Lord arranged for me. I, had, I really had nothing to do with it. But he arranged for me to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Dr. Vance Havner. Probably the most quoted Southern Baptist preacher of the last two, three, four generations. I was sitting down across from Dr. Havner at a little bitty table. And I shared with him the burden that I was facing, the burden that our family was carrying. In the course of conversation, Dr. Havner said, as no one else could say it, look me right in the eye. And he said, young man, I wish you could hear a new sermon the Lord has given me. He said, the title of the sermon is Why? 
And he went on to say, I want you to understand, if my Lord, while hanging on that cross, could look up toward heaven and ask why, then I think it's all right for you and me to ask why. And I'm not afraid to ask why. He went on to say, you, you may not receive the answer immediately, but it's still all right to ask the Lord why. In Paul's case, the purpose for his sufferings revealed right to us in verse 8. He said, lest I should be exalted above the measure through the abundance of this revelation that is given to me a thorn in the flesh. Paul's really saying to us, to keep me from being puffed up and too much exalted by the exceeding greatness of these revelations that the Lord's given me, that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Question, did God allow Paul to suffer from this thorn in the flesh to keep him humble? I believe that's exactly what he's saying. There was a purpose for Paul's thorn. The ministry of the thorn was to keep him humble. Now, why does pain and suffering come our way? It's all right to ask why. The trials and tribulations that come to us, they're for a purpose. We may not find out the answer to our question in the here and now, but rest assured in the sweet by and by, the Lord will let us know why. And then we will say that we're sure and we'll say it right along with Paul. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Today, we can know that by faith. But one day, we're going to see the Lord face to face and then we will understand and we will know for sure he makes no mistakes. Let me share that verse 7 from another translation. And to keep me from being puffed up and too much exalted by the exceeding greatness of this revelation, there was given to me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to rack and harass me, to keep me from being excessively exalted. Now, that phrase, a messenger of Satan, gives a lot of folks a big, big problem. But if you'll read one verse in Job, you might understand. Job chapter 1 verse 12 says, And the Lord said to Satan, now look who's in control, not Satan. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon him put not forth your hand. One translation says, On the man himself, don't you lay a finger. Now, in Job's case, Satan worked within the permissive will of God. And Paul saw his thorn as a work of Satan. Now, look at it. A work of Satan permitted by God for a good purpose. And we can be sure, there's no question about it, God's purpose is always right. The purpose of the thorn was to keep Paul humble. Why do Christians suffer? Don't ask me. I don't have the answer to all of these questions. But I do know God has a purpose, and I do know that his purpose is right. Always right. You've experienced pain and suffering, haven't you? Well, if you haven't, you're going to. You might as well get ready. Paul's thorn was for a good purpose. Why do 21st century Christians suffer? I don't have the answer. I just know God has a purpose, and I know His purpose is always right. For His glory, yes, for our gain. You'll experience it. Now, if you haven't experienced pain and suffering, get ready. You're going to one of these days. I want you to look at the second thing. Look at the supplication or the prayer of Paul. The suffering drove Paul to his knees. What's suffering ever done for you? I've been pastoring a long time, or was a pastor a long time, and I noticed that there were some people who would get mad when they 
experience the storms of life. What do you do when you're faced with pains and problems? Oh, some of us, you know, we don't pray. We just get on our knees and worry. And that's the difference. It's been said we can do two things when pains and problems come our way. Number one, we can get bitter. We can get mad at God. That's all right, I guess. Two, we can trust the Lord in the midst of all of our problems and pains. We can trust Him and He'll turn it into a blessing. Look at the way Paul prays here. He says, for this thing, this form, I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Notice something about his prayer. He prayed definitely. He didn't pray in generalities one thing. He prayed about this thorn. Is that the way we pray? Did you hear about the preacher who was called to come to the hospital to pray for a man the family said was dying? When the preacher got there, the family was gathered around the bed and in the hall and everywhere else that they could be. And the preacher began to pray. He prayed for the leaders of the nation from the president on down. He prayed for worldwide leaders, all that he could think of. He, being a good Southern Baptist, prayed for all the foreign missionaries that he could think of around the world. He prayed for the doctors and the nurses who were caring for the sick man. Finally, he said, Lord, I ask you to please touch and heal our dear brother. In Jesus' name, amen. Then he began to look and he asked the family how, how the sick man's doing. The son pr said, Preacher, Daddy is doing great now. He went to be with the Lord while you were praying for the people in Africa. <laughs> Paul prayed Definitely. He prayed about this thing, this thorn in the flesh that was bothering him. Do you remember how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Matthew 26 says he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. Now, Paul prayed like Jesus prayed. He prayed definitely for this thing, this thorn that it might depart. But he also prayed earnestly. He tells us he besought the Lord. He begged the Lord. More than likely, Paul begged the Lord in tears. Now, how do you and I pray when troubles and trials come? Are we always sincere and serious? Paul also prayed persistently. He says, I, I besought, I begged the Lord three times. A little bit of homespun theology. If it isn't worth praying about more than once, maybe we shouldn't bother the Lord. He taught us to pray and keep on praying, to seek and to knock. We should ask and keep on asking. Paul prayed definitely and earnestly and persistently, but look what it is. The thorn's still there. Nothing's happened. Oh, yes. Now, now, don't say God didn't answer Paul's prayer, but he did. God heard Paul's prayer, and God answered Paul's prayer. No, he didn't answer it like Paul wanted him to answer it. But he answered Paul's prayer with the right answer. Listen to me. God always hears, and he always answers our prayers with the right answer. When we pray sometimes, the, the answer is a definite, direct yes. You ever prayed a prayer like that? Oh, yes. Sometimes the Lord denies our request. When I pray for something selfish, when I ask for things I shouldn't ask for, when I ask for things that wouldn't be for my good and God's glory, He says no, and that's the right answer. If I really seek to do God's will, a no answer is just as important as a yes answer. Sometimes God answers with a delayed answer. God says, wait. 
Not now, wait. We need to remember in those times, waiting time is not wasted time when we're waiting on the Lord. When we pray, sometimes the answer is a different answer. Sometimes God doesn't give us what we want, what we ask for. Instead, he gives us what we need. Paul says, for this thing, this thorn in my flesh, I sought the Lord three times that it might depart. Now, when you get the big picture, when we can really see things as they are, we'll thank God for not answering our prayers. We ask for the wrong thing, and, and we'll thank him for giving us the right answer, even though we thought it was wrong. If we see, receive something else, oh, me, what, what would you be if God answered your prayer the way he wanted him to all the time? We'd be nothing more than a bunch of spiritually spoiled brats. The fact is, so often we do not know what's best for us. But God always knows what's best. So he always answers our prayers with the right answer. Now look at it. In Paul's case, it's suffering, pain. Then it's supplication, it's prayer. But notice the sufficiency that Paul received. Paul's prayer was answered in the greatest of all possible ways. His prayer was answered by a revelation of the Lord himself. The greatest answer is not the things we ask for. The greatest answer is the Lord himself. Look at verse 9 again. And he, the Lord, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now look where Paul is now. Most gladly, Paul says, Therefore will I glory in my infirmities. I'll take glory in those thorns that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now this is what I call a powerful sufficiency. It's the Lord saying, Paul, my grace, my favor, my loving kindness, my mercy is enough for you. It's enough. Make note of the contrast. God's strength. Paul's weakness. The connecting point made perfect. Made perfect. The Lord is saying to you and to me, my strength, my power are fulfilled and completed and shown most effective in your weakness. Do you get it? My weakness, my inabilities, can become an opportunity for God to display His power. Isn't that something? God's power revealed through my weakness. That's what I call a powerful sufficiency. But it's also personal. Did you see those personal pronouns? He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. Personal grace. Personal grace for you and your need. Personal grace for me and my need. This is so personal that you can put your name right there. God's grace is sufficient for Clyde Hawkins. I'm the weakest of the weak. But in every situation, God's grace is sufficient. His grace is greater than all of my sins. What a powerful personal sufficiency. But it's a present tense sufficiency also. The Lord says, my grace is. Not was or will be or can be. God's grace is. What Paul needs to do is appropriate and receive and experience and enjoy the grace of God. That's probably the greatest need among Christians today. We need to be experiencing and enjoying God's amazing grace right now. Are you doing that? Are you enjoying and experiencing God's grace right now? Answer, yes, you are. Now, I want to prove that one to you. Listen. Answer a question for me in your mind. But by the grace of God, where would you be right now? 
But by the grace of God, where would you be right now? D.L. Moody had his mission close to Skid Row in Chicago. It's said that D.L. Moody used to, on numerous occasions, would walk down to Skid Row in Chicago. He would walk down the street and he would see drunks laying in the gutter, wallowing in their vomit. And D.L. Moody would stop and he'd look at those drunks. And D.L. Moody would say, but by the grace of God, there lies D.L. Moody. But by the grace of God, there lies D.L. Moody. But by the grace of God, where would you be right now? But by the grace of God, I would be in the pits of a burning hell right now. I've sinned. I've come short of God's glory and the wages of my sin's death. I deserve to spend eternity in hell. What do you deserve? Where would you be but by the grace of God? Thank God this morning for His grace. By which I am saved and eternally secure in Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Marvelous grace of our wonderful Lord, greater than all of our sin. Folks, there's a powerful, personal, present sufficiency in God's amazing grace. And there's a plentiful sufficiency. The Lord is saying, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Paul, my grace is enough. As the need increases, so will my grace increase. How much of God's amazing grace do you need today? Well, let me assure you, there is enough of God's grace available for all of us. Enough of God's grace available for all of us to finish the course He set before us. Because of God's grace, Operating in Paul's weakness. That thorn became a channel of power for God. In the last part of verse 9, Paul says, Most gladly, most gladly therefore will I glory in my infirmities, in the thorn, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Dr. Graham Scroge called this, the song of the sanctified thorn. Suffering, supplication, sufficiency. Paul says, therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you want victory and joy and peace and happiness? If you do, and I believe you do, then you need to claim and you need to accept God's grace as found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible's clear. As many as receive Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, as many as receive him to them gave he power to become the sons of the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Romans 10. The Bible says, if you, that's personal, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That's the only way you'll ever be able to glory in the infirmities of life. Knowing you're loved, knowing that God's grace is sufficient. Oh, when you know those things, you'll be singing the song of the sanctified thorn. 
What do you need to do today? Do you need to take a step of faith this morning? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation in just a moment. Do you need this morning to step out in one of these aisles and come in repentance of your sin and trust the Lord Jesus Christ to save you for the full, free, and forever salvation? If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never acknowledged him as your personal Lord and Savior, then you're not going to realize the sufficiency of God's grace. You won't until you do trust him. Christian, do you need to come this morning and say, Lord, I want my weaknesses and my inabilities to become a display of your grace. Let's stand. And we're going to sing a closing hymn of invitation. And the invitation is extended to you. The Lord Jesus Christ personally speaks to our hearts. He makes us aware of our need. Christian, if you need to come this morning and make a fresh new commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you to do it. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient to meet your need this morning. If you've never trusted him, I urge you to come to do that. To come to make that prayer of repentance. Christians, if you need to recommit your life to the Lordship, would you come? Maybe you need to place your life, your membership in this church fellowship. I invite you to do that. You obey the Lord while we